All of you guys that say... Do it again because I didn't press record, sorry. Do it again. From where? From the beginning. You muppet. Okay. So what's going on, what's going on there? So, so if, you, if you just scan your camera over there, you can see Mansour is having a, a, a debate with some young lad. Probably doesn't know anything. Mm. Probably has got no apologetics or a, a, any kind of teaching. I don't know if he's a Christian or not. Yeah. But but the thing is, That's the, tactic. the Muslims keep saying in the comment section, why don't you go debate the Dawah team? Yeah, yeah. We do when they run away. <laughs> and then they go up and they go after young impressionable people who have no ability to debate. So there's your Dawah team, ladies and gentlemen. There's your lions of Islam feeding on cubs. <laughs> You know, uh, but... by contrast, we Christians like Hatun and myself, yeah. we go after your Dawah team yeah. and they run from us Every all the time. Hashim runs, Mansur, Shamsi runs, runs, Mansur, Mansur runs, runs, Hamza, Hamza runs. <laughs> Yeah, well, Yaya oh, yeah, no, doesn't yeah, run. No, no, yeah, yeah, I, I okay, give yeah, it to yeah, Yaya, he yeah. doesn't run. He loves the camera too much. Yeah. <laughs> so I want to do a talk. I want to do a talk, ladies and gentlemen, upon what it means to have a civilization. I want to do a talk about what it is to have a civilization. A civilization is the fruit of the ideas that express themselves in terms of the, the composite of a society, in its art, in its law, in its music, in its institutions, in its philosophy, in its festivals, in its traditions, in its languages, in its inventions, in the things that it values and the purposes that it commits itself to. These are the expressions of the ideas that make up civilization. It is the composite whole of those things that is a civilization. Now, these matrices are guided and formed by what come before, what beliefs become before, what technology becomes before, what ability comes before what wars occur, what economy is in place. These matrixes that we spoke about that make up civilization, they are guided by and formed by technology, economy, war. And thus, civilizations are, are something that emerge from the ideas that are interacting with, forming and being formed by technology, war and economy. And they express themselves through art, music, institutions, philosophy, festivals, traditions, languages, and what people value and so on. This is what a civilization is. A civilization is often something that is the possession of a people, of a tribe or of a nation. However, these tribes, these kingdoms are like the fortress that a civilization is held within, like a cell wall that contains the DNA. It's transmitted from generation to generation. But the reality is that history shows that civilizations are not something that are, is linked to genetics because civilizations change. Civilizations can be adopted. So for instance, civilizations can end. The Roman civilization ended in 1453 with the conquest and occupation of Constantinople by the Ottoman Turk. Western Christendom ended in 1648 with the Peace of Westphalia when reformed and Catholic Christians came to an accommodation with one another following a bitter civil war that killed 8 million Christians. The Ottoman Caliphate came to an end and with it the Islamic civilization of the Turks ended in 1920 when having been defeated by European powers the Ottomans had a reaction and set their civilization in a new direction. 
a secular European one as opposed to the Islamic one that came before. So civilizations can end, but civilizations can also be adopted. They can also be made into, um, your civilization can also be imposed upon you. So for example, when the Muslims conquered Assyria, they imposed Arab Islam on the Assyrians who had their own identity and their own culture. When the Muslims conquered and occupied Egypt, they imposed Arab Islam onto the, the Nubian Coptics of Africa. When they conquered Iran, they imposed Arab Islam onto the Iranians. So civilizations can be imposed from above. Civilizations can also be adopted as their own. So for example, between the 8th and the 9th century, the Carolingian Empire of the Franks adopted the Christian civilizations of Rome that were last seen in the 4th century. And so they adopted Roman art, Roman architecture, Roman language, Roman learning, Roman philosophy, Roman music. Everything that they could pick their hands onto that was Roman, they built their Carolingian kingdom upon it. And so civilizations can be adopted. And they can also be adopted by peoples other than their own. We've also seen with the Copts and the Assyrians and the Iranians. But when the Franks adopted Romanesque civilization, they went on to conquer other Franks. They went to conquer the Alemanni, the Bavarians, the Thurigians. They conquered the Frisians and the Lombards. They conquered the Goths. They conquered the Romans in Northern Italy and they conquered the Slavs. And all of those peoples adopted the culture, the civilization of the Franks. Now, what does this tell us? This tell us that the connection that is made between civilization and genetics by the ethno-nationalists is a false connection. It is a myth. It doesn't hold true to history. Yes, kingdoms transfer civilizations from one generation to the next. They defend civilizations from other civilizations. But all of the examples that I have given and the very matrix of civilization itself are independent of and not dependent on the idea of genetics or ethnicity. The ethno-nationalists are simply wrong. What a civilization is, is the birth of ideas in art and architecture, in music, in philosophy, in law, in institutions, in the things that a culture values, in the traditions. It is the birth of ideas that is civilization, not ethnicities. Ethnicities simply adopt civilization. And that adoption can either be imposed or it can be adopted without imposition like the conversion of the Roman Empire to Christianity was not imposed. It was something that came about through peaceful conversion. The French Revolution between the 1800s and the 1900s is another example of a civilization being imposed through force of arms. It overturned the Ancien Regimes and established a new normal between the 1800s and 1900s, that we are living in today, a post-Christian society. European civilization has always been informed by Greek philosophy, Roman law, and Christian faith. It is these structures, these ideas, that give birth to European civilization not our ethnicities, not our biology, 
Africans, Nubians shared in Greek civilization because of Alexander the Great. Ethnicity and civilization are not the same thing. Genetics, therefore, are not the prerequisite of a culture. Ethnicities are not the prerequisite of a culture. The Austro-Hungarian empires were multi-ethnic empires, but they were a common civilization. The Arab civilization of Islam was not an Arabic civilization. Greeks contributed to it. Assyrians contributed to it. Persians contributed to it. Nubians contributed to it. It wasn't an Arab civilization. Thus, neither was the Christian civilization of the Franks. It wasn't a Frankish kingdom. There was something else that binded these people to get together. And in the terms of Christian Europe, it was their Christianity. In terms of their, the Arab Islamic Empire, it was Islam that was imposed above. And the Dimis, who were seen as very separate, had to live a very separate life. Full rights only being bequeathed at the acceptance of Islam. And thus, when we think about preserving European civilization, we have to be careful not to fall into the lie of the ethno-nationalists. If there were 20,000 Nigerian Christians who absorbed the ideas of European Anglo-Saxon civilization, the beliefs of that civilization, the values of that civilization, and the traditions of that civilization, and the only thing that made them distinct, it would be fair to say that they are in harmony with European civilization. Now, I believe that European civilization is worth preserving. It is worth preserving. European civilization is the jewel of the world and that is seen by the envy that the world has towards it. The fact that when the shit hits the fan, people from the Middle East don't run to the beauty of Saudi Arabia, <laughs> they run to yeah. pagan England. Yeah. It's because pagan England, or Muslims, is more beautiful than Islamic Saudi Arabia. That's right. It's more beautiful than the Islamic Republic of Iran. Right. It's more beautiful than the Islamic Republic of Sudan. Yeah. Islam has failed the Islamic world. Why, Bob? Because Islam has failed. <laughs> Christianity has made Europe beautiful. Has made Europe work. And it should be preserved. The culture should be preserved. The ideas should be preserved. The idea of law should be preserved. The traditions should be preserved. The institutions should be preserved. The language should be preserved. But none of that is connected to the genetics. Not a bit. Yes, the Anglo-Saxon has, up until recent times, preserved all of these things. But the Anglo-Saxon is currently abandoning all of these things. And that is why I am saying that an Englishman who doesn't commit himself to the same things his ancestors committed himself cannot claim to be a defender of English civilization. If you don't commit yourself to the preservation of the religion, the theology that gave rise to Anglo-Saxon civilization, you can't defend it. But an, Eng an Indian who is committed to those theologies, could preserve it better than you. So, how then do we address as Christian nationalists, as opposed to ethno-nationalists, the preservation of our culture and identity? It's a rebuke to open-door immigration. It's a rebuke to liberal multiculturalism. And it is an embracement of the idea of monoculturalism as taught 
from a Christian perspective. We Christians don't need to learn about multiculturalism. We are multicultural within the church. It means that we place expectations on those who come to our culture. That at the very least, they will not make themselves the enemies of the Christian faith. But that they will stand, but they will stand on what Christian civilization stands for. So, so, just bear in mind there's having a little squabble behind. Okay. Okay. Right, so, guys, the point that I'm making to you is that European civilization is worth defending. But it isn't connected to genetics. It's just that the last inheritor of European civilization were those who lived here the longest, the European peoples. But if they disherit themselves, they have no claim to European civilization. Thankfully, there are many Christians who are committed to defending European civilization, and I am one of them. I am one of them who is committed to defending everything that was born and formed by Christian theology. But I do not recognize an atheist or a pagan as sharing the same heritage as me. They don't share the same theology. They don't value the same things. They don't have the same philosophy. They would want to have different laws. And thus they can't claim to be on the same page as our ancestors in Europe. And so as Christians, what we must do is commit ourselves to the preservation of our Christian European identity. And any European who wishes to disherit in himself is no different from the Salafists. He's no different from the Muslims who want to change us or the Marxists who want to change us. But I invite you ethno-nationalists to embrace fully and completely what Christianity stands for. And by embracing it, it means letting go of some of the things that ethno-nationalism stands for. Ethno-nationalism says that the foreign ethnic is not welcome here. But in the confederacy of the church, the Anglo-Saxon is for the Ethiopian. The Anglo-Saxon is for the Pakistani who shares the same Christian faith and would welcome them as our brothers and sisters. And we would, yes, expect them to integrate. Learning our language, learning our festivals, learning to value what we value. But a Christian Pakistani wouldn't find that transition difficult. An Ethiopian Christian wouldn't find that transition difficult. But the confederacy of the church means that we must also be open to what other ethnic Christians have to teach us, have to contribute. There is no sense within the Christian church of the idea that an Englishman couldn't marry an African. A Christian African is equal in dignity to a European and so yes we can form families and have children. And that means that there is a sharing within the confederacy of the church of many nations. And there is an infusion of cultures that enrich one another. The problem with many ethno-nationalists is they assume that when a Christian nationalist speaks like I am speaking, that that means that what I'm in favour of is just flinging the doors open and embracing liberal multiculturalism that they are already rejectors of. I don't stand for the same thing as a liberal secularist. I stand for a Christian identity in Europe shared by all Europeans and all those who are Christian. And I am willing to share that with any ethnicity. I don't believe in ethno-nationalism. 
ethno-nationalism is driving Europeans into the arms of the liberal progressives. Your ideology has failed. Your ideology is about racial purity and it is ultimately self-contradictory because there is no such thing as a pure race. And if you do get a pure race, it means you're having sex with your cousins and your children will be inbreeds. I like you, Pakistan. So, the solution is not ethno-nationalism. The solution is a rediscovery of Christian civilization, an embracement on it in a muscular way with confidence that it has the answers that our society needs and that it can address the failings of liberalism and that it can stand up to militant Salafist Islam. Hey. Your choice. Bravo. Any questions from the crowd? <laughs> what are the yeah, answers? Yeah, what are the answers to these problems? You just... We literally just did a talk. He did yeah, it. He, he did, did it. it. Did a talk. Well, I, 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 I missed Jesus it. Just, just give me a brief. The answer, the answer is that we rediscover what our civilization is. Our civilization is an expression of the ideas of our ancestors in law, in art in architecture, in music, in philosophy, in the things that they valued, in the festivals they celebrated, in the traditions by which they kept those festivals. And that was guided, they don't want to be on camera bro, that was guided by the theology of the church. And when we reject the theology of the church, the European man disinherits himself. He stops being European because European civilization was not born of his blood, it was born of his ideas. And we need to rediscover that, not in a timid way, but in a confident way, in a way by learning our history, by learning the Bible, by standing with, by identifying as Christians in the church. Wait. We've got to teach it in our families. From the beginning, from birth, you've got to teach your children to love their civilization and have a knowledge of it. No, of course it isn't. We are. We are responsible because we've allowed others who have disinherited us to tell us what we should stand for. The government has the influence that we give them. We need to make a choice to stop listening to the elites and to rediscover for ourselves what it means to be Christian. That's what we need to do. And then we form a new kind of politics and then we take over the government and then we pass laws according to our beliefs and according to our civilization. Any more questions? Any more questions? Then do it bro. No, that is this is not the way of the Christian. What did he say? It never happened. He said it will never happen. Ah, okay. This is the counsel of the hopeless. One second, bro. Are you a Christian? Are you a Christian? We as, let, me ex, let me answer as a Christian. The brother says it will never happen. We had our chance. This is the counsel of the hopeless. We as Christians must operate from a place of hope. What does it mean to operate from a place of hope? It means that we act as if the thing that we are seeking to make real can be made real even if we can't see it in the here and the now. We need to reorganize the way we do church. We need to rethink the way we do church. We need to rethink of our own identity and we need to claim the history of the church as our own, the doctrines of the church as our own. Our, the doctrines, the values of the church as our own and then we need to give space for them to give birth to a culture and then we need to defend that culture and demand that it has the rights to exist and if that means conflict it means conflict because Jesus said I did not come to bring peace but the sword 
to turn father against son, mother against daughter, brother against brother, and sister against sister. Choose Jesus, not the EU. Choose Jesus, not the communists. Choose Jesus, not the government. And embrace your identity as Christians. Choose Jesus, not the ethnicity. How can a tribe say it's all about racial purity and then worship a Jew? It makes no sense. Unless, as proud Englishmen, as proud Saxons, we commit ourselves as disciples of Jesus and thus to the confederacy of the church. Praise the Lord. I try to, in my life, yes. Yes. Romans 1.26. Romans 1.26. So what's the point of the question, sir? Yes, sir. You don't want to move cover. So Romans 1.26 says this. For this reason, for this reason, God gave them over to degrading passions, for their women exchanged the natural functions for that which is in natural. And in the same way, also the men abandoned the natural function of the woman and burned in their desire towards one another men with men committing indecent acts and receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error what's the question do i believe it yes i do yes i do the christian church there's only one church there's only one there's only one church and yes there are there are christians who are homosexual that's not a that's already broken one of the two values but but your problem is you're assuming that what the priests do represents every christian that's a myth a myth of your own making he's a christian he's a christian he's a christian i'm a christian just because there are some priests that sin doesn't mean that the faith that he has no listen to the answer bro listen to the answer bro listen to the answer bro that just because there are priests that commit sin doesn't invalidate the beliefs of all Christians. It just means that those priests have sinned and they need to repent. No, any good fellowship will excommunicate a priest who practices homosexuality. I am not. Yes, I do challenge them. I've just done it on camera. If you're a homosexual priest, leave the priesthood. Out. If you're a homosexual priest, stop practicing homosexuality. There you go, yeah, just yeah, in it for you. Thank you. I really appreciate it. So take a step forward to Jesus, bro. Yeah. Go on, that good. Take us. Yes, you do, bro. Now let's find a bass. Let's find a bass. Ah, a bass. Okay. A bass. <laughs> wait, wait, bro. Can we can we find a bass? 